Happy Halloween! It's me, Seb. Uh, I had a lot of like kind of Halloween-y, creepy ideas for videos to make, but in the end I just haven't felt like filming in ages. Um, and I haven't felt like doing anything in ages, to be honest. But like, uh, it's Halloween, so I thought I'd put something out. And uh, doing a recent reads is easy, because I don't have to be very creative about it. And also has the added bonus of including a lot of creepy content unintentionally, inadvertently. I've got a lot of creepy books in there. Apologies for the big mess that is this shelf behind me. Just don't look over there. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I'm in a new room. I'm in a new room and that's a work in process kind of thing. Uh, but, and this is, I think I'm gonna make this my bookshelf, but we'll see what happens. Maybe the books would be better up there. Uh, well, I don't know. Anyway, to begin with, the slow burn horror sci-fi, sci-fi horror, that is The Midwich Cuckoos by John Wyndham. Picture 1950s little English village called Midwich where nothing ever happens until mysterious things do start to happen, um, like a military blockade which stops anybody going into the village, phone lines which, uh, well, phones that don't pick up, I suppose, in Midwich, and lots of little things uh, making it very mysterious until it transpires that everybody in the village has fallen unconscious at exactly the same time. And anyone who tries to go into the village uh, also, once they pass a certain point, will also fall unconscious. So this is obviously very strange. There's a lot of uh, talk between like military commanders saying like, this is dreadfully peculiar and things like that, um, which is very fun to read. And then suddenly everybody wakes up again and again, there's like lots of reactions like, goodness, what am I doing on the floor? And all this stuff. And it's, uh, you know, it's really just like really lovely to read because we get uh, the whole first part of the novel is like kind of dedicated to this event, this everyone falling unconscious event and like the ripples that it sends through society at different levels at the sort of the day-to-day the -day villagers lives. There's the doctor, there's the priest, there's the military people, um, there's the scientists in a mysterious uh kind of like, I don't know, they have like a, what's it called? Like a, a unit or something which has been posted to Midwich, which happened before this, which obviously everyone's very suspicious of now. Um, and yeah, there's lots of just like kind of the, the societal fallout from something weird like that happening is the beginning of the novel. And, and this whole first part, and the whole novel in fact, is just chock full of um, these old fashioned British understatements. Like, no matter how much I think about it, I must say, I can't quite seem to make head nor tail of the matter. And, or for example, it seems preposterous to so much as hint as at any degree of veracity underlying such an assertion, and yet, when one is faced with the evidence, what else can one say? And all this stuff, all this kind of dialogue is, is like a, a huge chunk of the novel and it's really fun. The village itself is basically fine. Like some people have died of hypothermia because they were outdoors when it happened and they were a bit older. Um, there's like one man who died of hypothermia who was kind of close to the house of a married woman. So it's kind of implied that, you know, a lot of suspicions have fallen on her now. But apart from these kind of issues, basically life is just normal until it starts to become weird again, this time through the behavior of the midwitch women. And eventually after lots of little clues again, it, it transpires that everyone is pregnant or everyone in midwitch who can become or who could have become pregnant has become pregnant during the unconscious period. I'll stop there with the synopsis because like it just keeps teasing out bits of information like this and I could go all the way to the end but I felt like I should give at least a bit of a hook uh, to let you know what it's about. It's um, it's, it's a rare book for me because it's a reread. Uh, maybe, probably the first reread I've ever done on my booktube channel which is kind of cool. It's just I saw the audio book um, on my app and it was read by Stephen Fry. So it was like, oh yeah, you know, like one of my uh, favorite books by one of my favorite writers read like I've never experienced it in the audio format so I wanted to try that and also read by someone who's like a pretty cool comedian so it's like kind of yeah I just uh, and also again because it's so English and like he's got that kind of like manner about him you know what I mean but yeah there's so many themes that get explored in this book uh, it's definitely more sci-fi than horror but I think it I, I think it classifies as as horror as well because of the way that the weird events unfold kind of spookily and there's always like a threat um, of something, you know, that the, the threat is, is palpable, which is, I, I really enjoy. There's all these themes about like um, evolution coming into conflict with empathy, uh, biological imperatives coming into conflict with um, civilizational imperatives. And there's this one character who's very into like philosophizing, but it's, it's kind of, it's not a very difficult book, I would say in that sense, because like that character is, 
is important, but he's like kind of not the whole thing. So like we get lots of different voices because we get like the whole village as almost like a character in and of itself, which is something which I really liked about the book. Um, also, I think low key, it's kind of about like the arrogance of um, British imperialistic post-war, post-colonial or post-imperial, I guess, um, kind of identity. Uh, in this specific moment in time but I also don't know how much of that is intentional and how much of that is just like because the book was written at that time and and because it's kind of old there are some things that feel dated um, like the, the role of women in it um, although I would say that Wyndham is usually not very good at writing women but in this book I think because reproduction is such a huge important theme I think he kind of realized he had to have like interesting female characters and so I'm, I'm I think he did a decent job I think he did a decent enough job and a lot of the the things which seem dated aren't necessarily the writing, but more the society of that time. So it works in the context of the book, in my opinion, you know, especially because the book is kind of about examining society and stuff like that. So yeah, it was an absolute blast to revisit this book. I liked it um, as much as I did before, although I noticed loads of new things in it this time because I read it like over a decade ago, kind of embarrassing to say, but I read this book like over a decade ago um, and loved it then, I loved it now. I would recommend it to people who are into Cold War, paranoia, uh, restrained British people reacting to weird stuff, and uh, Sleeping Beauty. Next up we have another spooky one with The Promised Neverland Volumes 1 and 2. Um, more spooky in premise than in, in, in atmosphere. Um, and it's much more fast-paced than, than the, the Midwich Cuckoos. So this is a manga which is set in this idyllic orphanage, um, which is sort of like Victorian style -y, and it's in like this nice natural parkish kind of place, um, surrounded by a really big tall wall, which, you know, alarm bells should be ringing at that point, but they're just kids, you know, and um, all the kids eventually get shipped off somewhere when they reach a certain age, or they, uh, they, they might just get shipped off randomly as well. And it's one of these younger randomly shipped off kids who forgets her rabbit one day. And so two of the older children find the rabbit and they rush to give it to her before she leaves. So they go to the one exit through the wall. They find a truck which has tarpaulin over it and they lift up the tarpaulin and it's not good. It's really not good. So, um, like, I don't want to go in, I, I won't go into it too much, but basically they discover something terrible happens to the children and so they decide they have to escape. So at the beginning of the manga, the main conflict is how these two children are going to outwit the the mama, she's called Isabel, who um, has they've called mother all their lives, but now they know is sort of in league with the forces that be um, that are keeping them there on this sort of farm-like place. Um, and also how to like organize the children without telling them because their children are very young some of them are like you know like only four years old and so on so they don't want to tell the secret but they also need to get them ready for an escape that's being planned so this kind of conflict is the main thing and I kind of didn't enjoy this part as much because it's, it's, it's kind of it's very practical and problem solvy and it what I think really shines in this manga is the characterizations the three main characters who are Emma and Norman and Ray and they all basically want they Ray finds is letting on the plan pretty early and they all want to get out of there they all want to escape they all love each other and they're all and they all end up trying to outwit each other basically or kind of they end up working against each other because they each have different ideas about the right way to do things and they have different values and personalities and so the best way to escape is different for all of them and they're also like you know, not able to get the others on the same page. So the real kind of like tension and antagonism ends up being between these three friends. And that is so interesting and fun to read, I think. Having main characters who are working against each other precisely because they care about each other. It's just like, I, I, I loved it. I saw this originally in the anime and I, I loved, that was the main dynamic that I loved about it. And I like that too in the, the manga. Uh, so far I prefer the anime just because like, I don't know, it's weird, but having seen it in color and now reading it in black and white, it's, it almost feels like it's, the world has been drained of something, even though this is the original. So um, I don't know, like also the, the, the manga explains more because it has time to go into depth. But, uh, you know, a lot of it I felt didn't 
you know, could have just been brushed over like the anime did. So, um, but anyway, like I'm, I'm getting more into it now that the, the tension has shifted from the, from the, the, the antagonist being Isabel to the antagonist being the sort of the three friends working against each other. Apparently based on Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Ishiguro, which I've seen the film for but not read, so maybe that is one that I need to uh, add to the list. I forget the name of the mangaka, but uh, I think it's two people. But anyway, it'll be in the, the image or in the description or in both. I think like for maybe for most of these books, I'm not going to bother looking up the, uh, the, 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 the writers because it's, uh, it's Halloween and I want to get on with the day. Next up we have Emmer's Ghost. The reason I was drawn to this one is not just because it's a uh, children's ghost story, which already sounds kind of interesting to me, but also because it was written by a prestigious Northern Irish writer who is a man but uses a female pen name, or at least for some of um, his, his books. So that was kind of interesting because I think that's kind of rare. Like you see, I think lots of women who take male pen names, but not so many men who take uh, female pen names and I wonder like kind of about the reasoning behind that but I didn't like look into it uh, I just I uh, just picked up the book and and went for it but I didn't realize it was Northern Irish when I started reading it actually I thought it was like Republic of Ireland stuff and uh, so I was pleasantly surprised by the the it was an audiobook so the narrator had a Northern Irish accent which I could listen to endlessly um, and also like the, the the setting the culture is very much a rural part um, it's like it's a it's a place, it's a place kind of near the border um, I think, and there's this whole plot point about eggs being smuggled over the border once um, Ireland joins the EU common market. Um, and so like this, so the prices of eggs are totally different. And like the way that that is worked in, I thought was really fascinating. Like kind of you see the way that these kind of big geopolitical kind of decisions uh, impact day to day lives like farmers and, and so on. And then I kind of like had a like a moment where I was like, wait a minute, this is a kid's book. <laughs> you know what I mean, um, and I think as a kid, I, I wouldn't have, wouldn't have bothered me, but I would have just like mentally skimmed over that whole subplot thing going on, which is actually kind of important later on. Um, but yeah, so I thought that it didn't on some levels, it didn't really work as a kid's book. But then on other levels, like uh, the sister will like the, the main character. I didn't even tell you what the story is about. There's a girl. She finds a doll. Then then a ghost starts appearing. Um, and, and that's basic. I mean, yeah, there's like this has a lot to do with Northern Irish history uh, uh, and, and I don't know it just didn't really work for me because like yeah like I was saying the, the kids stuff Was too infantile for me to enjoy. It's like they kind of tease each other a lot and I'm like, yeah, okay I don't need to read like kids calling each other stinky head or whatever um, But I think as a kid I would have enjoyed that but then other parts the like kind of historical bits seem a little bit too sophisticated for a child reader so I kind of felt it fell in the gap somehow between like a children's book and a more like adult book um, and and yeah it was it was a shame because there was a lot of interesting stuff going on there but like I would say the the historical and political specificity of this ghost story is both like the strength and the weakness it's the strength because it's it's what makes it stand out it's what makes it interesting um, as, a, as, as not just any old ghost story um, but it's also a weakness because yeah it's, it's not very engaging as a children's as children's literature do you know what I mean um, and since I wasn't so into the story then I couldn't really remember any of the history stuff that I learned while I was reading it so it didn't even work as, a, as an educational tool for me a big problem for me was just that the, the ghost was really tame and again this is a children's book thing whereas as a kid I might have liked that about it but I don't know it was just she was so nice she was so like kind of not threatening at all and like I felt like there needed to be some strangeness you know there needed to be something to kind of like make me kind of surprised by by stuff going on I never felt any peril I never felt any strangeness um, but uh, then when I got to the climax it just like really out of the blue completely wrecked me <laughs> because like I think it's because I'd gotten my expectations so lowered and kind of understood, okay, there's no, nothing really bad can happen in this story because it's just a nice, pleasant, uh, you know, ghost will guide you by the hand kind of ghost story. Not, you know, it's obviously a nice ghost from the very beginning. There's nothing really threat. And then like suddenly, bam, something incredibly realistic happens. I won't say the ending in case people want to read this book, but um, I, was com I was completely like, exposed emotionally and it just like I was like crying like listening to this on the audiobook like walking home I think maybe the the thing that happened happens to be something that I personally 
uh, have worried about or like worry a lot about or like like somewhere deep in my subconscious I've got a fear that something like this could happen and then it happens like out of nowhere so it really yeah it really it really hit me <laughs> that ending and uh, I, I'd be interested if other people uh, also find it a bit shocking but definitely I wouldn't want I wouldn't want kids to to read that I think it's a bit yeah it's too too real it went from like zero threat to to way too much threat <laughs> by the end of it um, but anyway that's Emma's ghost Speaking of ghosts, next up is Ghost Wall. That's right, more scary walls. Um, this one was, okay, so there's a teenage girl and she is with her parents in a, with a university class in the north of England and they are on a sort of like Iron Age, oh, what's the word for it, like kind of not, not role-playing, <laughs> not not LARPing like they're like they dress up as the people and they like reconstruct the life it's not a reconstruction either though you know like kind of living out as though they're Iron Age people basically um and uh, her father is sort of like a hobbyist and this university class are like kind of doing it for research or whatever um and she is just like living in the in the shadow of her father her mother also is her father obviously is like from the beginning we know he's a tyrant um he's like you know, like really horrible and abusive in lots of different ways and the girl is sort of caught between different worlds where she knows that her father is like kind of really terrible but at the same time she doesn't quite gel with uh, the students who are like kind of from the south of England and they're a bit more like kind of posh and a bit more like kind of liberal and um and and they don't understand like what what her father does or where he comes from so she's she defends her father when she talks you know like with the students and so on um so it's, it's kind of interesting that kind of teenager stuck between two worlds thing and the atmosphere of like um ten the tension that builds through like there's lots of descriptions of nature and stuff like that which all feel like kind of pregnant with foreboding for stuff that's going to happen the prose is uh lyrical and vivid and really sensory um again with all the nature stuff uh, but at the same time, somehow that it feels quite academic, I think, and quite like themey and conceptual. Um, and that sounds kind of nice when I say it out loud, but it, it didn't, again, this didn't, this combination didn't really work for me. Like there's all these themes. It's a super themey book. And the themes are things like uh, patriarchy and, and, and gender stuff and uh, the past and like kind of what it means to like, um, you know, have a, 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 a national identity attached to nativism, like a native people who are coming from a, a particular land. Um, it's connected to the north-south divide in the UK and Brexit and class in the UK. Um, and there's lots of, lots of meaty stuff going on in there. Um, and I don't know, it felt like a, like a really pretty essay in a way is what how I felt like with with this tension that's going all the way through um and even the tension I have to I have to say didn't really work for me because like I you know there's those things they put on the back and or on the on the front whatever like unput downable and you have to read it in one sitting and that was absolutely true I think for this one because the tension kind of builds from the beginning all the way to the end without little really releases um, but that isn't something that I like personally. Um, it doesn't work for me because like I want to put the book down sometimes I don't want to read a whole book in one sitting. Um, maybe that's just me But um, yeah, like and, and, and this is the book if you do put it down and then you pick it up later You know that the tension has gone obviously so you have to kind of build up again from from where you were You've, you've deflated the thing that was building so maybe this would work if you read it in one go But I, I didn't and um, I read it pretty quickly, but I didn't I didn't do it in one go so I found this book I mean, I'm glad I read it because I wanted to the reason I originally read it is because I saw a review which referred to it as like a brexit novel and I was like, oh how is this a Brexit novel? <laughs> and um, I think it is, but it's also like, um, yeah, it's very thought provoking. And I was impressed by the writing and like the way that the, the conceptual stuff is linked to sensory stuff, but it was not really fun, I would say for me. It wasn't really fun to read. At least for me, I didn't feel like captivated by it or anything. Um, but it did remind me like plot wise, I would recommend instead of this, I would recommend um, The Idol of the Cyclades um, by Julio Cortázar, which is a short story, which in terms of the plot is kind of quite similar to this, I think. Um, but yeah, it's much shorter, obviously, because it's a short story. And also, you know, it doesn't 
does it explore things like Brexit and like kind of the North South divide and the patriarchy? No, it doesn't explore any of that stuff. But is it very fun and very spooky? Yes. So um, yeah, I, I, I would pick like that short story over this book in a heartbeat. Next up, I read a poetry book called The Cardboard Sublime, written by Oliver Sedano Jones, who is uh, my cousin. So I mean, like full disclosure for potential bias here, but how cool is that, right? This is a very vivid, uncomfortable, kind of experimental poetry, I would say, that like, doesn't hold you by the hand at all um, when you go into it. I, I had a bit of difficulty getting in like kind of like properly involved at the beginning. I felt like a lot of it was sort of going over my head, but I kind of just like, um, I, I think the more I read it, the more I got used to the voice, the more I started to get into the rhythm of it. And um, by the end of it, I was just like kind of really like connecting with and loving basically every poem. I especially liked some of the poems like uh, took a very specific focus and um, like one idea and then like went with that as a, as a theme um, and, and, and made it kind of, you know, it worked because it was both familiar and weird because of the, the defamiliarizing uh, language. This is one like about an argument, um, like between people who, who love each other, obviously, and it's, uh, it's very recognizable. And there's like, it, 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 manages, it manages to sum up like very familiar feelings with very uh, like kind of um, unfamiliar imagery. Um, using really pithy lines like there's this one about like turning the other cheek en route to a roundhouse kick which really stuck in my head so the, the, the that that idea of you know like oh the reason that like turning the other cheek at first like you're you're doing it in this way to sort of like kind of make yourself all meek and humble and but actually you're doing that just to get at the other person like really bam uh, make your point um, and like in a sort of like really petty and vicious way and importantly like it's funny right like a, a line like that is just funny so the strangeness and the humor really work and a lot of the humor like I think really works because of it, it's quite angsty it's quite like kind of like angsty angst and humor is a combination which I've learned I really love in in literature whether it's it's fiction or or poetry in this case so yeah I highly recommend it and I'll leave a link in the description so yeah, we've moved on to non-spooky territory, obviously, by this point. Um, and this one is The Fish Can Sing by Halder Laxness. Uh, the Fish Can Sing, like, if you want to, like, explain it in a, in a hook, you know, like, kind of the, the, the one to, the, the, the sentence to grab you and make you interested, it would be that something like a boy from a rural uh, background and the poor background um, finds out that his life is inexplicably like strangely mysteriously linked to a world famous Icelandic singer he's the boys from also from Iceland um, and uh, that singer and he interacts with that singer several times as he's growing up and he learns from that singer that there is such a thing as one true note but if you ever sing that note you'll never be able to sing anything ever again now the problem with that sentence is it really doesn't explain the novel very well at all it doesn't represent the novel i should say because it's not a plotty novel it doesn't have that kind of momentum that you would get from that that sentence so i'll do i'll do now that i've done the hook part i'll do the sort of the the more faithful the more honest uh, explanation. Um, so it's, it's a Bildungsroman uh, set in Iceland. A boy is uh, left to be raised by an old couple in a place called Brekukot, which is outside of the future capital of Reykjavik, which is always referenced as the future capital of Reykjavik. So from the very beginning we have this sense of two worlds, one of the past uh, and one of the, the future and and the boy as he's growing up is sort of bridging those two worlds and what exactly the two worlds are like past and future and Iceland and outside of Iceland and that, that keeps shifting in an interesting way throughout the novel but yeah the the old couple uh, who take in the boy they also take in uh, basically what the narrator calls refugees so people who don't have anywhere to go or they need like a place to stay while uh, like at a certain period in their life while they get their shit together so it's like it's the book is like the Icelandic title was the the, the Brekukot Annals um, and it, it's not actually I think about Brekukot even though it is sort of like uh, Emmer's Ghost and like uh, the Midwich Cuckoos it is actually a novel which is very like about a place you know about community and about a certain very specific place in history and time it's still also like it's not Brekukot it's Iceland really Brekukot is like one facet of Iceland um, and it's like one of the possible uh, identities that Iceland has. It's sort of the old world, whereas the new world is like the modern um, capitalist uh, kind of like more like kind of heading towards the, the future kind of Iceland, like integrated into the, the global uh, community. 
whereas Brekukot is sort of run by traditional folkloric uh, values and it's, it has its own economy even which it describes as being distinct from like the local markets and and much more distinct obviously from global markets so um although it's like it's, it's the economy thing is only like part of the book but it gives you a sense of like different realities and again of, of capitalism being kind of connected to nationhood and what it means to become a modern nation means entering into capitalism that's something which is low-key uh, explored in this book I'd say but it's very slow it's very meandering it's very philosophical and it's very like um, oddly spiritual I think because of the the role of music and singing and and art I think um, and sort of like this 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 uh, actualization of the self or whatever you want to call it um, but I, I really I really loved it <laughs> and I, I talked a lot about a lot more about it in in my vlog which I'll link in, in one of these corners and then we'll go back to Spooky Town with Thornhill. Thornhill is a uh, YA or middle grade, I don't know, uh, graphic novel with two timelines. One of them is told in a diary format and the other one is told purely with images. The diary is set in the 1980s. It's about a little girl in an orphanage who is uh, kind of isolated and terrified by something. And the uh, the, moder the, the the picture one, the picture part of the storyline is set in the 2010s. And it's about a girl who's moved into a house which overlooks uh, the old abandoned orphanage, uh, which is called Thornhill. And she keeps seeing a light in the window. Uh, so those stories are kind of separate, but obviously interconnected through the, the building of Thornhill and through, you know, as you read on, they, they become they become more and more the same story. So I had gorgeous drawings, really unique storytelling style, which I've never um, experienced before. Um, and I'll leave a, a, a review. I'll leave a link to the review somewhere that I did somewhere here. <laughs> so I think I will stop there. I have a few more that I've done, but I will. I'll, yeah, why well, save it for, for next time? Um, especially because I'm not reading so much lately, so I, I gotta I gotta save some material for down the line. You know what I mean? Um, but anyway, I'll uh, thank you very much for watching. Let me know if you read any of these or what you've been reading or whatever you want. Just let me know, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye. Happy Halloween.